Okay, here's what we, uh, we talked about last time. We said that if I take a crate and I drag this crate across the floor with some applied force, there's going to be a component of the interaction between, like here's the floor and here's the crate, right? Well, <clears throat> there's an interaction, right, between the crate and the floor. If I draw an interaction diagram, I say, okay, well, this is the force of the floor on the crate. Now, we have a name for that, for that component of the crate on the floor, I mean, the, the floor on the crate, and we call that the normal force, right? And then here we have the force of the This is the force of the crate on the floor. Oops, I'm out of it today. So this is the force of the um, crate on the floor, right? This is Newton's third law. For every force on one object, there's an equal and opposite force on another object somewhere in the universe. And um, so here's an applied force. Well, there's a, that applied force is on another object out here somewhere. It could be a person pulling on a rope or whatever. But now there's another interaction between the floor and the crate. Uh, the normal force, by definition, is perpendicular to the surface between the crate and the floor. And that's why it's called the normal force. Normal means perpendicular. But there is also a force parallel to the two of them due to, to, to a rubbing. And so this will be kind of awkward. This is the force of the uh, floor on the crate. And of course, there's an equal and opposite force. This is the force of the crate on the floor. But here the interaction is parallel. And this, of course, is the force of friction. Okay, And of course, this is the friction as applied to the floor. This is the friction force as applied to the crate. So if I draw a free body diagram of the crate, I separate it from the interaction diagram and only draw the forces acting on the crate, the applied force, the force of friction, the normal force, I'm sorry, the, the weight, mg, force of gravity. Oh, I left that off of here, the interaction diagram. And the normal force. OK. And so then we can apply the procedure to, to all of this. But I mean, the, the bottom line, I and mean, here's the point I'm trying to make, that if you were to actually draw the, the force of the floor acting on the crate, it would actually be some force that's kind of upward like this, because it would include the parallel component, which is the force of friction, plus the normal component. Um, but, but we're not really ever going to do that. We're always we're going to take, it's as if we're taking that one force, that interaction between the crate and the floor, and we're just automatically breaking it up into its components. And the, a component that's, that's perpendicular to the plane of interaction and, the, and parallel. And, and the perpendicular we call the normal force. The parallel we call the force of friction. All right. Uh, now, and then we said that, you know, if, if here's an empty crate. And if it's empty, it doesn't have much mass, and therefore, it doesn't have much weight, and therefore there's not a whole lot of normal force, and therefore there's not a whole lot of friction. So if I apply this applied force, this thing's really going to go, whoo, you know, if it's big enough. <clears throat> but what if I fill this crate with, you know, lead bricks? Okay. <clears throat> 
Well, now all of a sudden the weight is much greater, the normal force is much greater, and the friction force will be much greater. And what we have here is a, an, you know, we can do an experiment to show this is true, but we can say, hey, the, this force of friction is directly proportional to the normal force. Okay. And, oh, and one thing though, <clears throat> I, I shouldn't put these vector hats on here. Because here we're really talking about the magnitude. <coughs> this force of friction acts to the left while this normal force is perpendicular to it. So, uh, now, the amount of friction you get for every unit of normal force you've got depends on the materials and it depends on mu. And mu is this thing we call the coefficient of friction. And the coefficient of friction depends on the materials involved. Right? If you have some materials are, are much more slippery than others, like steel on steel is actually fairly slippery, um, very low friction. If you have um, you know, rubber on pavement, there the coefficient of friction is quite uh, high. That means you get a lot of friction for a given amount of normal force. <clears throat> okay, so that's the coefficient of friction. Now, there are, there's two kinds of uh, friction here, and there, here's the part that we didn't really have time to get to, and I just want to briefly talk about. Let me take a, uh, here's a, an eraser, and here's an inclined plane. It's kind of awkward to do this on the document camera, but oh well. Um, actually, let me do it like this. Now, um, here's a physics textbook. Now, I'm going to, right now, the angle of incline is zero. But if I start lifting this thing up, I start tilting it, I'm increasing the angle of incline, and eventually, see the eraser starting to slide now? So there is an angle, there is a specific angle where it's the maximum angle you can get because you have the maximum amount of uh, friction that you can get um, while it's still, uh, that will keep it from moving. And so, uh, you know, or if you want to think of it like this, here I put the eraser down, I'm going to apply a force to it now, if I apply a force to it, I am pushing on it a little bit. Well, it's not sliding yet. So there's a force of friction this way. My applied force is, is in this direction. There's a force of friction like this. But we call this static friction because it's not, um, it's not, there's no motion, relative motion. But if I go beyond a certain point, it will start to slide. Okay. Now, if I draw a picture of that, let's talk about static friction. If I have um, my eraser, here's my eraser and here's the tabletop, and if I apply a little bit of force to it, well, let's draw the free body diagram. I'll zoom in. This is too small for you guys in the back. So, if I have a little bit of applied force, now of course you, we've got the weight and the normal force, and these two are equal to each other in this case, but I've got a, uh, let me put, let me change this a little bit. Here's my applied force, and gee whiz, I haven't had much coffee yet today. All right, so, now here's my friction force. But this is static friction, because there's no relative motion, right, between the surfaces. It's, it's staying in place. Now, <clears throat> 
if I make the applied force a little bit bigger, what has to happen to the static friction force? It has to become bigger as well. And why is that? Yeah, it, the, the eraser needs to stay in equilibrium, which means that this, these two forces have to cancel each other out. So I'll make the applied force a little bit bigger. So the, the force of friction gets a little bit bigger until we've exceeded the maximum possible force of friction and the, then the object will start to slide. Okay? So if we measure that maximum, well actually what we measure is the applied force and then we notice that, that this thing is starting to slide. So really what this is, if you have static friction, we say the force, the maximum force of friction I can get is equal to mu. Now this is mu sub s. Okay. Can you, you need the letter under there. Okay. The static friction mm -hmm. times the normal force. Okay. And so here's the thing to realize is that this force of friction if you multiply it by the static coefficient of friction times the normal force you're getting the maximum possible static friction but of course can the static friction be less than its maximum sure it's just going to be what it needs to be to cancel out that applied force you know so when the if the applied force is really small Okay, the applied force is like this, well then the force of friction is only going to be that big. Okay, but then, oh, oh if I push harder, this will be, you know, this will be, uh, this arrow will be longer. This arrow will match this arrow until you get to this maximum. Okay, and, um, and quite often we'll, we'll solve problems you know, to determine the maximum possible force of friction of, of, uh, for uh, static friction. Yes? Um, so is the friction and the force like equal in magnitude but opposite in direction? Because we're saying that the eraser is static. Now what is what do we mean by static? It's there's is there's no acceleration. There's no relative motion between the eraser and the floor. Okay? Now, what happens when you exceed this maximum force of friction? Well, you do have relative motion now. So here's my applied force. Here's my force of friction. But maybe this applied force exceeds this friction. And we've got the weight again, and we've got the normal force again, of course. And this is called kinetic friction. And kinetic is just a fancy word for motion. So there's relative motion now between the surface and the, um, and the object, in this case the eraser. Um, now, here we say that the force of friction is going to be equal to mu kinetic times the normal force. Now, What's going on here? Why, why do I distinguish between the kinetic friction and the static friction, coefficients of friction? Well, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but with a lot of materials, you push on it, you push on it, you push on it, and then once it starts to slide, it's a little bit easier to keep it going. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. And that's because usually for most materials, Usually, I'll put usually, mu static is greater than mu kinetic. Okay, now why is that? That's a great question, and it's, a, it's an area of open research in, in uh, physics and material science. Um, it, what's probably going on is that when two surfaces are not sliding, there's actually a little bit of weak bonding going on between the two materials. But once they start sliding, there, there isn't 
there aren't those bonds anymore, those little weak bonds. And, and so um, thus this kinetic friction will be a little bit less. Yes? Yes. It's in the party of motion, it's not that they're not going to seek together. Yeah, so, so the question was, wouldn't the static friction be higher than the kinetic just because when the two surfaces are, are pressed together, those little imperfections, those indentations are more locked in place, and then maybe it actually rides up a little bit as it sli if it's sliding? I think that's probably true. Um, and it does, once again, it does depend on the materials. And you know what's going on with the material. So, sometimes the static friction and kinetic friction are way different, like um, like ice. You know, you can get a kinetic uh, friction on ice that's that's very very low compared to the static friction with ice, and that's because something weird's going on. Like a a, a, a skate, if you're skating on ice, that blade actually melts the water a little bit. Uh, or melts the ice a little bit, you have this little film of water and it makes it really slippery. Um, now, here, and that brings me to the final point I want to make. These, these equations are rules of thumb equations. They usually work. And in fact, we're going to use these equations for all the friction problems we're going to have this year. But know this, this these are not laws of nature. Okay, when I say F net equals MA, the net force equals mass times acceleration, that's a law of nature. I mean, that just works every time. No exceptions. Well, at least we've never observed an, uh, an exception. These are rules of thumb, and they can change. Uh, for example, if you are skidding to a stop, um, the coefficient of friction between the rubber and the road can actually change. Why is that? Usually, it's because the temperature is getting hot, right? If you slide two surfaces together, the, the surfaces get hot. That can change the properties of the materials and change the coefficient of friction. So um, these are uh, simplifications that work qu uh, quite, a, quite often, but they're not uh, laws of nature. OK. So anyway, I think that, that completes um, what I want to talk about uh, with friction. There's two kinds, static friction and kinetic friction. Um, now it's just a matter of using them in hundreds and thousands, perhaps millions of problems. Okay, so you can master it.